thank you, Egor, for the introduction. Um, so I'm, I'll be presenting one of my uh, research, research that is ongoing uh, about um, trying to monitor grassland height uh, in the Ostmars Basin using auto machine learning. My name is Nuno, and uh, as Egor said, I'm a PhD student in Leiden University. My, my topic is in about using eco-informatics tools to monitor uh, dynamics of ecosystems. And the, 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 the point is to try to integrate data from multiple sources, okay, and try to answer some fundamental ecology questions, but possibly. Uh, and and I've, my focus is then a lot on, on monitoring by physical traits of vegetation or biochemical traits of vegetation, and then trying to relate that in specific with uh, nature-oriented solutions. And that's why we have a focus on the uh, Australis Plasen which is a, a nature park here in the Netherlands. And that's a Google map, a terrible Google Maps uh, crop. Uh, uh, and the, the nature park is very nearby, but this data is to show that it's nearby to Amsterdam. And it's kind of a, a, a protected area where uh, herbivores was allowed to roam free without any predators, with very small management. And it has been a, been a, a contentious park recently in the Netherlands. But for a long time, it was considered one of the good examples of, of uh, rewilding. Here I've set up an experiment. I'm looking to landscape fragmentation, both on the water part, but also in the, in the grass area. In the grass area, we actually established a bunch of cameras and we were monitoring the animal activity using cameras. And it was an experiment that was ongoing until the, the deers actually destroyed all the camera positions. But we did collect some data and that's something we are working on. Um, so the point of this research today is to focus on monitoring grassland height. And the, 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 the thing here is that the grass, the, there's a, a competition between the different animals. And what's happening is that the deer population and possibly also the geese population are overgrazing and they graze the, the grassland so low that the cattle cannot eat. And that is causing, you know, it's also out competing against the horses. So you see an increase in deer population uh, is kind of causing a decrease, maybe because this is not a statistical test uh, on the other uh, the other animals. And the point is, can we monitor grassland height using remote sensing? And we have, of course, to look into the last you know years, not just um, the last five years, but the last twenty years. So we need a sensor that is freely available uh, for those periods. Okay, uh, so. The point is then when we go to do any exercise like this, we are going to pick up some machine learning, we're going to pick up some remote sensing data and then picking up that remote sensing data, we're going to try to find what are the best data that solve our issue and what is the best algorithm. And then we're going to do some feature generation and we're going to do some preparation of our data to try to find the best algorithm to solve. And this is a problem that happens in, in not just remote sensing, but, but in any machine learning exercise, right? You, you have to find whatever algorithm works better to solve a specific problem that you were asked, right? And you can either recruit a, an expert to solve every issue that comes to you, or, or um, you have to find a way to automate this, this procedure. Um, and, and basically, when I'm speaking about this, and I, I, I'm, I'm afraid usually with the type of audience I have, if they have an idea of what's going on behind or not, but what we're trying to find is what type of pre-processing steps we need to do, what type of algorithms we need to use, for example, a random forest can support like the machine, and what type of parameters we are going to use in the algorithm. So these are the three main things. So what, how are you going to prepare the data to be used, how, how we are going to select the algorithm, and then how we are going to configure that algorithm to solve our problem. And that becomes can be seen as, a, as an optimization problem. So the optimization is a field of mathematics that say that studies how to find the best combination of parameters to solve a certain issue. Uh, for example, if you want to buy a car and you a criteria is the color, and if it's an electric engine, and if it's the price, so how you, you join all these parameters and find what is the best combination of all of them and find the best you know, car that suits your case. And in our case, machine learning is always trying to minimize some error, right? We want to minimize some classification error. We want to maybe minimize autocorrelation errors. So we want to minimize some error metric. Uh, mm -hmm. And the way people go about this, and you've, if you have done classification, you have done this somehow. Uh, you have tried different algorithms. You have tried different uh, uh, parameters on your machine learning algorithm. You have tried uh, uh, all possible combinations that somebody have given to you has given to you, and and maybe if you're more advanced, use some Bayesian inference model to try to find for 
for your for your case. So, for example, we could try the, uh, the the random forest with you know ten trees or hundred trees or hundred fifty trees. So those are the the kind of um, problem we're trying to solve, trying to automate. And a lot of these machine auto ML focus on using Bayesian methods to to try to automate because Bayesian methods minimize the number of times let's say that you would have to compute when you have to compute. Uh, 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 all possible solutions, you can find yourself in, in a problem that is almost unsolvable in some cases. Uh, and if you use a Bayesian framework, you can minimize your, your number of computations. Okay, so that's AutoML. It's instead of the, the, the expert tries to do all these different steps, uh, you have some model that just, you know, picks up the data, does all the, identifies the best processing steps, and then it defines the best, the best models and just blows out a, a, a prediction. And these predictions are in the level of state of art. So they are not necessarily going to be the best, 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 because it doesn't mean that they're going to find the best, but they are going to be on the top uh, contenders. And it's relatively demonstrating that's what happens with AutoML. And the idea is exactly to substitute the, the need for humans uh, in, in the, the procedure. And it's also the, the idea is obviously, if you have a service like this uh, in your you know, web, web application, then your clients can come, put their data, and you provide them a good prediction without having to put a, an expert working on their problem. And that's the whole point. There are hundreds, I wonder, maybe it's too much, but some dozens of examples uh, out there. Uh, they depend a lot on the type of framework that they are working on. We are going to focus on, on two of them, autoscaler and auto glue on, uh, but you have a lot more. And you have some of them that work in R, so you don't have to use Python for this. Um, okay, so going on. What is autoscaler? So autoscaler is focused on using SkyCit Learn. So that's scaler is SkyCit Learn. Uh, it's about automating using the tools that you have in SkyCit Learn. And it is fundamentally divided into three parts. You have feature preprocessing uh, uh, that you have to, to find which, which is the best feature preprocessing, data preprocessing, and uh, the algorithm preprocessing. So the, the, the algorithm is going to try different methods to solve problems in these three, um, three, three places all at once. Uh, and it uses a Bayesian, a Bayesian optimization approach. So it starts either from a known number of of algorithms and then tries to find which parameter I should change first uh, in order to improve my accuracy. Uh, so that's kind of the Bayesian optimization logic. And, in, and it has a specific case of meta learning where basically what they did is they trained the model for days and months in Kaggle data sets and then used those characteristics and those models that came out from there as prior models for your uh, model to start. So basically what this means is, is when you are giving in a new task, it's going to look at the similarities between your new task and tasks that it has seen before and start from the models that are similar to your task. So it, it minimizes the, the, the variation in the results actually a lot and, and, uh, and provides a very quick, uh, quick solution for, for many people because it has seen thousands of problems before or hundreds of problems before. Autogluon is different, uh, so it's, it's from Amazon, so it's a relatively recent uh, algorithm, and they don't do any tuning. <laughs> Instead, they, they use a, a weak learner approach. So they, they have mul multiple models that are trained in sequence. So for example, train first model one, then model two, then model blah, blah, blah until, until all the five, 10 models that they have in the library are trained. And then those features, those models are used to create features for the next layer, and this continues on for for a bit until until uh, until the model is working properly. And of course, they have some methods inside to, to try to stop overfitting. But the whole logic here is you can you know use the trained outputs from um, uh, under previous models as features on the next layer. So this is very similar to a neural network, but the, instead of using neurons, you are using models. Uh, that's that's how they, the authors actually define it. Um, yeah, and this is uh, quite interesting because it means that you don't use uh, a lot of time computing any hyperparameter tuning, which is usually the, the problem uh, of machine learning. Uh, so this is a, a relatively interesting approach to solve, to create good accuracy without too much uh, problems. 
And this, this means that they are very, very different between them, right? So autoscaler on the top finds a pipeline of pre-processing steps, uh, tries to solve the cache problem. Uh, and in case of the, the, the auto glue on, it, it just finds an ensemble solution of you know, pre-processing people models that are all weekly learned. Uh, and what happens with the, with the auto skill learn is you have all this information about reprocessing steps. You can try to find patterns in your reprocessing steps. So you can kind of explore uh, deeper to improve your model to a task. And in the case of the auto glue on, you just have very good accuracy very quickly. Uh, I would say that that's, that's the big difference between them. Um, so the idea is we are going to monitor grassland height in the OSMAS plus and, and we are going to try to emulate one of the main methods that people do in remote sensing, which is feature selection and also feature engineering. So basically NDVIs and, and EVIs, that's feature engineering. And we're going to try to emulate all possible solutions that uh, an expert will come up with, uh, do some hyperparameter tuning, basic hyperparameter tuning. That's also what people do in machine in remote sensing in general. And then see how that compares against, you know, just a simple auto auto ML model, uh, and see if uh, which one does better. So basically, that's the step, right? You pick up your raw data, do some feature selection. You choose band X and band Y, and this band is too bad because it's affected by atmosphere. You do those kind of selections in the expert, and then you put in some model tuning, and then you put in your training and predict. And, and auto ML, you just skip everything and just go directly to the training and let the model find find uh, the the solution, the best solution. So that, that's the data that we had. We have uh, some transects collected between 2013 to 2017, different times of the year. We, we collected all the data, found the uh, remote sensing images that were most closely associated with each point. Of course, sometimes they are a week after, a week before. Um, and then investigated which algorithms people use for this type of monitoring. And there's, you know, lots of examples of people doing different things. And that's also a typical thing in remote sensing is People try different algorithms, but then in their manuscripts, actually, they just report, you know, the, the ones they use or the one they used. And that's kind of uh, a bit sad because, in a way, other people could learn from the algorithms you didn't use. Um, so, in the end, we have 10 features. So, the six bands from, from uh, that are the same resolution in the, in the, um, in the OLE and the Lensat ETM, so that you can use both. And we generated, you know, common uh, vegetation index used using this this type of approach. For the GLM, we selected only 165 feature combinations. It has to do with the multicollinearity. So we did a VIF test to remove combinations that were too inflated in terms of of multicollinearity. And then for the machine learning, we used all possible 1,023 combinations of features. Uh, for for every model, and then we de optimized the model for any for each combination of features. So it's, it's, it's like there's different models for different combinations. And the auto auto ML and auto scalar is we use it as it should be used, which is without any much decision. You just throw the model inside, minimal minimal uh, interaction from from the humans. Let's say we just increase the the time that it's allowed to train. Um, Okay, and then we do, you, we use the forty percent of the data for tuning and for for all cases, and then we use a repeated cross validation. So basically, it's a k-fold cross validation, but then we repeat the random sampling a hundred times, so that we have a better distribution of the error. Yeah, uh, that's our method for for getting the the results. And the final, of course, is auto scalar and is is a lot better. So this is the mean absolute error. And is 1.73 centimeters, and <laughs> which is a bit, uh, uh, a bit, a bit, uh, let's say, optimistic error. But the auto, the whole idea here is to compare uh, results between auto ML and classic approaches, right? How far can we go? And uh, the the auto ML is better in all cases, and you know, the only that comes closer is the K and N, the key nearest neighborhoods. Okay, uh, if we then look at the <coughs> Type of the best models uh, that were selected for for each of the classic, you see that you know there's none of them is the same. They're all different combinations of bands and different combination of vegetation indexes, and different So this this kind of starts starts to, to think what what is the difference between selecting different features when you are doing classification. If in the end, you know the the, the differences between these models are are minimal, right? And this is even better observed here, where we look at the best 10 models and the best 25 models, the best 50 models for each algorithm. And there's almost no difference between them. 
So the implication here is when you are selecting fixtures, you are, you know, kind of moving between peanuts because the machine learning is made to fit. And if you optimize your model quite well, you might work with, you know, different bands, even if, if, if in theory they should not work. Um, and this is also interesting, is if you look at the best 25 for each algorithm, we see that only 90 times there was a shared structure. So they could have 150 potential structures, let's say that are equal. Um, and they have only 19 of 150 feet. So very few times different models find the same structure of a model, right? But there are indeed bands that are selected more often. Band two is selected the most often. Uh, so that's the green band. We are looking at grassland, so in a way that one makes sense. Except for the support vector machine, when everything is kind of a bit random, which is uh, interesting, uh, to be honest, why that happens. Might have to do with the type of model. Uh, vegetation indexes don't play a much bigger role when compared to, to just using direct raw bands, uh, in my opinion. The other thing is, we look at out of scale learn, we see that there's almost no error, increase, no, no improvements after certain time budget. And we see that, for example, 30 seconds, we can already have 30 seconds of training. You can already have accuracy of 1.7 centimeters. So you can see in comparison to the type of work that you'd have to do to prepare a classification when in forest. And then if you pick up that, and then you just pick up out of blue one, put your data in, and you have 30 seconds after you have a model ready to use. So that's, that's the big difference here, right? Um, and then you see that you know, there's not much increase in changing in error for any of them. One thing I'm going to, to just show very quickly is we're going to explore how the auto scale and reports the results, not doing the same exploration for auto glue one because it's a bit meaningless in this case. Um, so I'm just going to show you in online how does it actually look. Uh, so for example, if I uh, train a model, I, I'm going to have a certain pipeline, okay? And this pipeline, if I let's put by type, uh, the first steps are uh, pre-processing steps in the data, and then you have pre-processing steps in the features, and then you have the algorithm. So if I select it, then I have all these steps. I hope you can see more or less well. Uh, you have categorical transformation steps, numerical transformation steps, and then a feature agglomeration step that is a, a way of, of correcting the data. Or, or aggregate data that is similar, and then it goes to the random forest, and then it goes to the final output. And then here you can explore, for example, the parameters of each model. And you could explore, if you have longer time training, you can explore to find if there are feature preprocessing steps that are used a lot of times. You can also get some, some estimate of the error. You can also get a, 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 type, a type, how much weight was made in the ensemble. So the next graphics are kind of going to show how a summary of this, but ideally you could explore the summary interactively like this, but in a publication it's a bit hard to make. Uh, okay, so we see that in the terms of the, of the auto scaler, uh, the random forest is used more, uh, more, more quickly in, in both cases, when you use meta learning, you don't use meta learning. Um, but then it stops being as important. This is basically the model is trying different algorithms and, and finds, you know, better, better results for different algorithms. The more time it has, the more algorithms it tries. So in theory, we could even put an hour of training and get a super model. But of course, it might run to overfitting issues. Um, but these are very simple, simple interpretations you can make from here. You see that there's, in terms of pre-processing, in the case of my data, there's not much importance. There's not much dominance in a kind of, of, uh, of uh, pre-processing steps. Uh, the, you see also that with meta learning is a much more organized testing. So it starts one third of the models for each type of pre-processing step and then uh, one, one fifth and then one something and then maybe starts having a bit of dominance here. And when you, without meta learning, because it can use all the models, it, uh, it has no direct starting point. It, it can start from a random position. You have a bit more variation. Then we look at categorical and medical pre-processing. Uh, basically, there there are no dominance from anything. It's the same the same the same issue. Uh, but the rescaling was important. Basically, it's always used uh, in most cases. Um, okay, so in general, uh, auto scaling is better. Uh, auto scaling auto ML models are, are not just better. They expected that they are better because they do a lot more than what uh, uh, an expert will do, even in terms of remote sensing. Uh, 
which is kind of expected, to be honest. Uh, the, the classic, the nearest neighborhoods was the best one, which is uh, not so expected, but it's, let's say, the nearest neighborhood is a very simple algorithm. It just uses the mean value of the neighborhood, which means that it might be that it depends a little bit on if there's too much variation in your data or not. But it was the best in this case. Traditional methods often focus on interpreting, you know, band selection. So you do a prior expert knowledge selection of bands and you say NDVI is very important for biomass. Uh, but then in the end, if you don't really compare it against all the other possibilities, does that have uh, much value as a conclusion? And the next uh, approach is to try to use this with animal population data, integrate these results with the population data that we have. That's for future research. Okay, so in terms of autoML, this is a general con con conclusion. It's very important that you look into these things if you especially want to, to look into deploying as services. Uh, there's no adaptation of autoML for, for remote sensing tax at this moment. And there's a lot of things we could do, right? We could have, you know, steps testing if it's the model is an optical sensor, the wavelength, if it needs to, for example, use RTM inversion for some cases. So a lot of things could be done to uh, adapt this to, to remote sensing. But other ML is, is a good way to get good results uh, without uh, having to need an expert. Okay, and if you want to try, I have some examples. I This example is already correct, so you can actually go there and use it. You have to use a GPU, uh, a GPU to make it work properly, and it's very unstable because every time somebody updates something, it breaks. Uh, so the auto scale is a bit like that. But if you want to try it, just let me know and I'll show you how to implement in your case. And uh, auto glue is much better uh, in that sense. It works a lot, a lot easier because I guess it's maybe more standalone ish than auto scaler. And yeah, that's the end. Looking forward for your questions. I hope it was clear.